Life Audio. Today we are talking about the idea of intercession and specifically intercession for other people that either maybe know God and have fallen into sin or maybe don't know God at all. And I wonder if you've ever thought about that or if you've ever practiced that in your own life, that intercessory prayer. And what I mean by intercessing is really just through prayer, pleading a case for someone else. I think that that is something that maybe we do out of desperation when we're facing some hard circumstances or somebody that we know or love is facing some hard circumstances. But what we see in the Psalms is intercessory prayer on behalf of the nations. And I think given the the climate that we have right now, this is a really important skill that as believers, we really need to hone in on. So stay tuned. We're going to talk about that and more today after a word from our sponsor. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time? Especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff? And even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Ramp Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand his will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are reading through Psalm 79 in our devotional reading through the Psalms. And if you're just joining us, we are over halfway through the Psalms now. Every Monday I send out an email that has a link to the podcast episode, a journaling prompt. And I find journaling is a really helpful way to get the information from your head into your heart. If you would like to join that mailing list, you can go to shehears.org on the homepage all the way at the bottom. You can sign up to be added to that mailing list. Again, that's free. That comes out every Monday. If you would like to go back and start at the beginning and you like the Psalm study, but you want to start, you know, all the way from square one, You can go to the resources section at shehears.org and you can find our guided journal. It's $5. It's called God Beside Us. And what that does is it has the first 50 psalms in it. It has a journaling prompt, a key verse, some space to journal, and a link to each of the audio devotionals. So again, just another resource to help you if that is something that that you would like. So I'm going to be reading from the NIV and I'm starting at verse 1. And this is a psalm of Asaph. O God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call your name, for they have devoured Jacob and destroyed his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of our fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? 
Before our eyes make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants, may the groans of the prisoners come before you by the strength of your arm. Preserve those condemned to die. Pay back into the laps of our neighbors seven times the reproach they have hurled at you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. So like I said at the onset of this episode, this psalm is is set when the nations have been invaded. And what we're seeing is the psalmist interceding on behalf of the nations. And so um, by interceding, like I said, what we mean by interceding is he's basically pleading a case for others through his prayer. And he's asking God to not only forgive the Israelites for their rebellion, we see that in verses 8 and 9, but then he's also asking for God to punish the nations that have destroyed Jerusalem and God's temple, and he's asking for accountability. Um, and, and what we realize in this psalm, and remember, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians back in 586 BC. And so you can read more about that in 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25. But the psalmist is realizing that the Lord has used these other surrounding nations to bring judgment upon Israel. Yet those nations that had worked against Israel, um, that was carried out because of those nations having a hatred for God and for his chosen people. And so what we see here is the psalmist is motivated by concern for not just the people of Israel, but for God's honor and his, and his reputation among the surrounding unbelieving nations. This psalm is one that we would call a community lament. And, um, yes, initially it is written as this intercessory pleading prayer, but it becomes a prayer, a community prayer when it's used in the context of the temple and Israel. I think it's telling because it helps us see into what the mindset was of the people when they were now in this post-exile community. And they're talking about beginning this agonizing process of really looking at where they're at spiritually, of course, as well you know, politically and socially, but they have this devastated community. And like we've been talking over the last couple of days, this is, remember, they have gone into Babylonian exile. And so they're dealing with a lot in this season and they were had, had been in exile for quite some time, but they're starting to take an inventory of where they're at. And an, like I said, analyzing their spiritual state and what they're recognizing is that God did allow some of this to happen And he used the surrounding nations to hand out discipline. And I think sometimes what happens is when we are dealing with the consequences of our own actions, just humanity in general, um, initially, I think the tendency is to blame all of those other circumstances. And after a while, though, or maybe even in hindsight, sometimes what we can do is we can have a little bit of... I guess it wouldn't be hindsight. We can have a little bit of hindsight to look and say, okay, yeah, those circumstances were terrible, but God used them to get me back into relationship with him or God used them to drive me to my knees in prayer or God used them to get me back into church or back into community or back in my Bible. And so while those circumstances were terrible, and of course, you know, you will have some people that say God caused all those, all those terrible circumstances. We have to remember that like what we're seeing with Israel, this was really terrible circumstances, but it was a result of their sin and their own rebellion. And so I think it's so important for us to recognize when we have those kinds of things going on in our own lives and be honest and say, yeah, this is a consequence of my own actions. And not only is it a consequence, but I can see God's hand in allowing it to happen, not that he caused it to happen, but allowing it to happen and working in and through that situation to get me back into right relationship with him. What we see throughout this psalm is the psalmist really appealing to God's character, Yahweh's character, as the basis of action. And he he talks about Israel's desperation in the act of repentance. And like in verse nine, it says, this is who you are. And so what we can see from this is that there's this religious climate 
when there is no prophet present, I mean, back in 74, we recognize that there's no prophet present, but the psalmist is appealing to the covenant. And that's what we see back in 74. So in comparison in Psalm 79, what we have now is he's going beyond the covenant and he's appealing to his character and his action and his behavior. And, um, you know, there's some subtle differences between Psalm 79 and Psalm 74, but it's not just based on the promise. It's based on the behavior of God. And I, I think that's something that we've been talking about yesterday. Even we talked about looking at the stepping stones of God's faithfulness. Yes, we can look back and remember God's behavior, the way he acted in the past to inform us how he's going to um, act in, in the future. But I also think it's really helpful to bring those things up in prayer and have this confidence and appeal to God, especially when we're interceding on behalf and, and just saying, okay, God, I know that you're faithful and I saw your faithfulness in this situation in my life and I'm asking you for your faithfulness or your protection or whatever it is in this season of my life. I think that's a really important part of intercessory prayer. I think we're going to take a short break here for a minute and hear a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll get into the rest of this psalm. Stay tuned. Hey there, it's Nicole Eunice, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. So as we dive back in, there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, It refers to, in verse 1, the defilement of the temple. And it says they have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. Now, there are some scholars that would say that this is one of the Babylonian invasions because we know that there was three deportations by Babylon. Um, So this could have been part of that or this could have been when it was the complete fall of Jerusalem. Either way, um, we know the temple treasures were removed and defilement of the temple doesn't necessarily mean destruction of the the temple Um, because defilement could have been even just, you know, they were trafficking foreigners through the temple. That would have been enough to defile it. And it doesn't say destruction. So I'm just saying that because of the timeline, some scholars, you know, waffle between when this was written. But regardless, we know that it could have been possible that Jerusalem was in ruins and the temple was still intact. In verse two, when it starts talking about your servants and your own people, that's kind of a window into the self-image that Israel had at the time. And they're acknowledging that they should have been obedient to their master And it's a reminder that they should have been obedient. But then it's also a reminder to God when he says, your own people, that's literally meaning the faithful ones. And it's, it's referring to that covenant loyalty, both on their own part and the part of God, because there was this remnant of faithful followers that were still there. And so he's making this appeal on their behalf or as one of those. And then if you think about what state that Jerusalem was in, in verse three, it says there was no one to bury the dead. I think that, of course, in and of itself is a tragedy um, because it prevented their their dead family members from being gathered to their ancestors and and buried. And there was such a, a ritual as part of their culture, but also it's just human decency and concern to take care of the dead. I mean, that's, that's even common in our, our culture. And so to think about what it was like to be in a posture where there wasn't even anyone to bury the dead. I mean, that's a pretty desperate circumstance that we're seeing at this point of history. In verse four, when it talks about the neighbors, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, those neighbors, it's essentially talking about how they, those neighboring nations have exploited Judah. And as part of this destruction of Jerusalem, they're part of that. And um, he's kind of calling out these neighbors of theirs, these neighboring nations. And then, of course, we see this rhetorical question, how long, Lord? And will you be angry forever? And it, it does not cause God any pleasure to see that Israel's going through this. And of course, this feeling of this burden of them experiencing God's anger and God's wrath, that breaks God's heart even 
more than the physical destruction, this disruption in relationship is really at the core here. And that's the, that's the thing that God's trying to restore by allowing them to suffer the consequences of of their actions. And you have to remember, I think when I used to read these, um, not just these Psalms, but even in other parts of the old Testament, when I would read about the season of Israel's history, I would just like think like, oh God, you were being so harsh. Why were you so harsh on them? But you have to remember what was going on. They they had been so unfaithful to God's covenant, not just by worshiping other gods and marrying foreigners and, um, you know, forgetting to, to even worship God, Yahweh as the God of Israel, but they were doing crazy things like sacrificing their children to the fire and um, just all sorts of, not just sin, but really, really horrible horrible things that God gave them chance after chance after chance after chance. And finally he had to intervene. And so then when we're seeing this on the other side of that, we're seeing God allowing them to, to suffer the consequences of their actions. It feels so harsh, but yet we're realizing that they, they brought this on themselves by their previous behavior. Now, when it comes to the other nations, um, the the reason why the Lord is punishing those surrounding nations is not just what they've done to Israel, um, but what they've done to God as the leader of Israel, as Yahweh, he was the God of Israel. Those nations exceeded the task that Yahweh gave them to do against Israel. So their excessive violence against Israel was something that was justifiably punishable. And um, I, the one of the things I think the that gives me the same maybe an easy metaphor, easy way to explain this is, and I'm so simplifying this, but I think it's helpful when I was explaining this to my kids is, you know, I have, um, teenage daughters and when they were little one, you know, they would pick on each other, they'd fight each other. And my one daughter came and said, mom, you know, she, she hit me. And I, you know, this had been going on for quite a while. Don't come after my parenting skills, but I finally was just like, okay, hit her back. And, you know, I, of course, maybe I was channeling my Old Testament and eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of scenario. But um, this is after a long time of bickering. One was always kind of banging on the other. And finally, I would just like, you know, stick up yourself, hit her back. Well, what she heard was hit her back as in like the body part of her back. And she hauled off and she punched her right in the spine. And I mean, it was vicious. And we had to intervene. And, you know, she did have to have some discipline and intervention. She certainly, you know, she says that she thought I meant like hit her in the back. Obviously I meant like slap her back on the arm, like her sister had done to her. And so while she had been given a little bit of authority to, to go back and do that, she took it too far and she hurt her. And so then we had to intervene. And that's kind of what I think of when I think of, and of course I'm totally, it's nowhere near the amount of violence. And of course the things that they were going through in Israel, but that's kind of what I think of when it comes to the surrounding nations, like, like maybe Yahweh gave them a job to do, but then they took it too far. And so that's why God is disciplining those surrounding nations, even though they had initially been part of his plan to, to bring Israel back into right relationship. And then what we see in verse eight is kind of this prayer that comes into play because of that. And so when it's talking about, um, well, let me just read it. Do not hold against us the sins of the fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us for we are in desperate need. This prayer, I mean, the psalmist is confessing this present generation's own sin and he's talking in verse nine about the sin against us. He's talking about a past generation where perhaps God is holding the past generation sin against the current generation. And so he's praying against that principle that God would hold the sins of the fathers against the third and fourth generations. But what he's doing he's, is he's t- trusting this divine grace that was promised to a thousand generations of those who love God and keep his commandments. And that, that was back in Exodus. Um, and even in Lamentations chapter five, we read that Exodus Exodus chapter 20. So God's grace exceeds the nation's over-exercise assignment to punish Israel for their sins. And so what the psalmist is doing is through intercession and through this petition of prayer, he's praying that God's grace would come quickly and that God would remember this promise to give grace for a thousand generations for those who love God. This urgent need, when he says we're in desperate need, um, this urgent need is the reason for the Lord's intervention. 
and it's constituted by what the nations have done to is done to Israel and how much that affected them far more than perhaps maybe was initially intended. And that desperation, what he's talking about, what he's praying through is political, it's social, it's theological. It's just a tragedy all the way around because Judah is suffering at the hands of these neighboring nations. And then in verse nine, it says, help us, O God, our savior. And that word savior, it literally says, translated in the original text, the God of our salvation. And that's a slightly different nuance than, than the savior, um, because it stresses the identity of God as being salvation, meaning it's putting an emphasis on the activity of God. And so the difference is between help us and deliver us. And what the what the psalmist is praying for is deliverance from this situation. Not just like help us through it, but get us out of it. And then it's clear when it says forgive our sins, it's clear that salvation here is the very meaning of deliverance from sin, not just the deliverance from the crisis that they're going through. And so the psalmist is recalling what God has done in the past. And this is the prayer for the current generation now too. Again, it's more of those stepping stones that we've seen. There's a tender prayer that this psalm closes out with where it appeals to God as the shepherd and it, it refers to the people as the sheep. We've seen this in the last couple of psalms. So it's talking about your servants, your people, the sheep of your pasture. And so this tender prayer is really a confession that's that's helping to remind God of the second part of the covenant, the whole phrase where it says, you shall be my people. He's, he's bringing that up as an appeal, as an intercession to remind God, okay, these are your people. Can you intervene and deliver us? Cause we're helpless without you. So given that insight, I'm going to go ahead and reread Psalm 79, starting in verse one. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and destroyed his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of the fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, Where is their God? Before our eyes make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. May the groans of the prisoners come before you by the strength of your arm. Preserve those condemned to die. Pay back in the laps of our neighbors seven times the reproach that have hurled at you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. God, we thank you so much for the example of intercessory prayer from the psalmist on behalf of those that are are in desperate situations, even because of their own sin. Lord, I think sometimes it's so hard for us to come to that place um, and recognizing that Yes, we are in these situations because of our own fault, our own sin. But yet we know, God, that you are merciful. We know that you are a God of grace. We know that you are a God that loves us intimately and deeply. And so, Lord, when we are facing situations, even like what we're facing right now with the political and social climate, some would say it's not that far off from, from what we're reading in the pages of the scriptures. God, help us to intervene through prayer and to recognize that, that intercessory prayer on the behalf of those around us is effective. And there is a call to that in the scripture. And Lord, we thank you that we see your hand as the shepherd, as caring for the sheep. We see that throughout the pages of the Psalms. Lord, I pray today for my friend that may be listening that um, you would even right now bring to mind somebody that they can go to prayer for, intercessory prayer, reminding you even of the things and the ways that you've been faithful to that person in the past. God, I thank you that as the body of Christ, you've given us each other to pray for each other and to um, just stand in the gap on behalf of 
of each other when we are going through these desperate situations. Lord, I thank you for your design and your purpose for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey friend, do you feel like you need a little one-on-one? My goal for the She Hears ministry, the Hearing Jesus podcast, all the resources that we have is to really help you learn how to hear God's voice so that you can be confident in your relationship with him. And if you're struggling to learn how to identify or even overcome the barriers that you have in your life to growth, I want to be able to walk through that with you. Did you know that I'm a Christian life coach? Maybe you're struggling with something and you need some objective biblical insight or opinions, or maybe you need to work through something that feels just a little bit too heavy to do on your own. I would love to walk through that with you and land on some practical ways to achieve that goal. And so I have some limited coaching opportunities. If you go to shehears.org, there's a section where you can schedule some one-on-one time with me. I have Mondays and Fridays open right now going into the new year. So I pray that if that is something that you need, that you've been praying about that it would be an opportunity for you to take advantage of some one-on-one time with me. And again, my heart is really to help you lean into whatever it is that God is calling you to do. I pray that that's a blessing for you. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. Why are Christians always so serious? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we take Jesus seriously, but not too much else. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com.